Hello everyone, welcome to Cashcroft TV. My name is Kalen Ashcroft. Thanks for watching this second video on the Guide to Legal History and Historians, where I will be going through the Oxford Handbook of Legal History, edited by Marcus D. Dubber and Christopher Tomlins. Once again, I uh, addressed the Oxford Uni University Press, and I've been told that I can make this video. However, I must notify you that I've not been endorsed or vetted by the Oxford Unity University Press or the editors. So the structure of this series will I'll be going through each chapter, chapter by chapter, but um, through the context of the writers of each chapter. So it actually kind of fits kind of like in my previous series, kind of like a Plutarch's Lives. So I'll go through each chapter with reference to the two writers, and then we'll have a comparison at the end. So today we'll be covering Gunter Frankenberg from the University, the Go University in Frankfurt, Germany, and Simon Stern from the University of Toronto in Canada. So without further ado, we will begin with Gunter Frankenberg. So Gun this chapter is in the first section, the context locally locating legal history, and it's starting with chapter three, Critical Histories of Comparative Law, once again by Gunter Frankenberg. So a little bit about him. He what he is I get the correct page. He's a professor of public law, legal philosophy, and comparative law at Goethe University in Frankfurt, Germany. He also previously was a visiting professor at Harvard Law School, Tulane Law School, and Penn Carey Law School, as well as at Science Sciences Po in Paris. He has a Doctor of Law from the University of Bremen in Germany and a Doctor of Philosophy in Social Sciences at the Technical University of Munich, also in Germany. He has some notable publications such as Authoritarianism, Constitutional Perspectives, published by Elgar in 2020, Comparative Constitutional Studies, Between Magic and Deceit, published also by Elgar in 2020, and Comparative Constitutional uh, Constitutional, oh, pardon me, that was published in 2018, and Political Technology and Rule of Law, by, also published by Elgar in 2014, as well as many other publications. So, in terms of this section, Critical Histories on Comparative Law, so he opens with this, um, this quote, Comparative Law by himself, Comparative Law has a history oscillating between marginalization and megalomania. So it's been a movement that has resonated on behalf of the protagonists in a minority complex and delusions of grandeur. So it has caused an unstable self-image and therefore the discipline has been at unease. That is the discipline of comparative law. There, therefore, he will critique um, and provide a critical approach to address this and therefore might serve as therapy, and that's the aim of this chapter. So he starts off with the birth of comparative law as a discipline. So the disciplined lend protection. So disciplines, he opens up by kind of describing what a discipline is. So a discipline lends protection to cover up historically contingent ways, ideas, and practices are gathered and organized. So, and then they are centralized into broader categories such as philosophy, medicine, art, or in this case, law. However, only disciplines as institutional formations are recognized as legitimate arrangements in academic institutions, and therefore they become the basis of funding and reputation and power. So that is why it is important that the, the discipline of comparative law becomes, um, is precise or, and also not too precise as well as to aid openings. But furthermore, it is the basis of how in, uh, intellectuals get funding and power in the communities. So, the methods and exploratory theories, there's, uh, um, as outlined as a normal science by Thomas Kuhn, um, the uh, comparative law as a discipline is quite, quite, um, um, exactly started in Paris around 1900. They can trace the roots of comparative law back to Aristotle as one of the founders, Mont uh, who is from the fourth century BC. Montesquieu uh, is on the spirit of laws in 1850, was, was one of the founding documents of comparative law. And Henry Summer Maine and Max Weber 
as the heroes of the 19th century. However, it was the Congress International de Droit Comparé in Paris, which rose the study to a collective concerted venture and therefore guided by theories, methods, and projects. So although their comparative law did exist in previous history, all the way back to Aristotle, it wasn't until 1900 in Paris where it became a formal, formal science in itself. It's, uh, and this um, Paris school was dominated by Raymond Cecilio and Edouard Lambert, who replaced the École des Exégis, which is basically the um, a, a structured school based on largely religious principles, with Droit commune de l'humanité and Droit commune de l'humanité civilisée, uh, respectively. So basically, they um, created these general approaches, uh, the communal approaches to um, laws that are constant across all humanities or constant across all uh, civilizations. Similarly or contrastingly, depending on how you view it, the German faction led by Joseph Kohler observed Herder's and Hegel's similar pattern of legal development where they observed common legal developments across different geographies and they sought a Weltrecht, which is a world law. So that essentially in Paris, however, was where comparative law as a discipline started. So he uses the analogy that it has a, a Cinderella complex in that comparative law in the Western community is marked by significant inferiority complex because it is not adequately recognized by academic peers or in curriculums in law schools. It is seen as a peripheral study uh, seeking an audience, so it doesn't have a, the audience it seeks, therefore it has what he notes uh, the Cinderella of legal studies. It has had a long infancy, however he says it is now in its teenage maturity, and this is marked by its only marginal changes in curricula, however it has grown in popularity, therefore kind of like in its teenage stage. It's hopes for invitation to the prince to become the princess of legal studies or become have its own coronation as queen but right now comparative law is not quite there yet as he outlines and the, similarly it has overly ambitious method or the method Montesquieu in that they want to seek the highest possible standard that is comparative law and the widest scope and the most complex of complexities. So the, the objectives of comparative law are a little bit too ambitious to um, earn it the respect and power that it might deserve. And law of the whole world, including all geographies, times, and peoples may be seen by many, or even uh, comparative law scholars themselves as too ambitious. However, it has become a respectable body of knowledge with many tools and resources and it has a peculiar feature in that method and subject matter are coextensive, and therefore in the field of comparative law, there is only one method because you're just applying this method to all to compare essentially. So this is caused for what he calls the veil of innocence in that there is nothing but a method. And it is supported by the claim that by necessity counts as a science. So if it's automatically a science, it kind of veils some of the deeper complexities. And it ignores Evans Pritchard's dictum, there is only one method in social anthropology, the comparative method, and that is impossible. So if the, if the only one method is impossible, there is no place for comparative law. In the 1900s, there started to be a more directive approach to comparative law, so before it was um, although it was largely just more um, taxonomy. However, it took a more directive approach, particularly after World War II, in that they sought to create a world law and therefore comparative law became more important. And uh, this contrasts taxonomy, which is a purely descriptive study of comparative law. However, it's been marked by white universalism, especially during the the and the partition or division of Africa, and it has largely been led by Western democracies and WAFs, white Anglo-Saxon Pro Protestants, so it has been 
um, although comparative law, the objective should be to observe laws in all different geographies and all different peoples. It has been largely um, concentrated by uh, this one group. So the universal law and jurisprudence, yeah, he calls it the silence of the lands or the golden era. It was implicitly limited to civilized members of common and civil law family, in the, specifically in the backdrop of the scramble for Africa. And they were merely feeling the pulse that trembles through all people. So they were almost, um, although observing perhaps the laws in Africa, they were not really taking a hands-on approach during this period. And they were once again hiding behind the veil of clean-handed humanitarian rhetoric and noble claims to truth and objectivity. So that's why naming it strictly as science, they are perhaps not helping those who might benefit from better laws and therefore benefit from comparative legal studies. So in terms of the turn to practical knowledge, there's been a triumph of functionalist method now what's called the Trento, now Touring Group has manifested this specifically in that the Trento Group or the Touring Group has aimed to create one common private law across all the European Union and as to um, bring the countries closer together but also to individually create greater prosperity for each constituent nation. And they took a formulist approach to establish a common practice for private law in the EU where they combine Rudolf Schlesinger's functionalist functionalism and Rudolf Sacco's structural investigation. So combining two leading intellectuals to create a, a formalist approach, uh, or pardon me, functionalist approach. And there has been a, it's called a neutrality of skepticism is, and therefore they're seeking to find the what is rather than what ought, which is obviously not what we want to do in entirely. And how and there's been innocent aspirations where they've leaned over backwards to make it purely scientific. So in some cases there could be real tangible implications through studying comparative law. However, by naming it as purely a science, they are leaning over backwards and avoiding the um, the, the, the main benefits or the best benefits that could come of it. So the tragic history of taxonomy, which is just essentially naming and classifying things, there's been an obsession with classifying all. For example, he references Archimedes, who was a um, famous in uh, the classics. You can uh, watch my um, videos on ancient Greek and history, so anytime anyone mentions that, it's important. However, Archimedes had this imaginary outpost that was, and the, there were laws in this outpost that have been um, studied in comparative law. However, these have never been called into question. However, people have at all costs avoided uh, deriving implications, real world implications through focusing too much on taxonomy. So, similarly, there's been starting from Aristotle's classifications by de definitions to Montesquieu's taxonomy of the three forms of government to Maine's classification of status and contract-based societies, and furthermore, taxonomy hit a high point with Maine's or through Rene David's in the 1950s Grand System, and Amignon's, Knowles, and Wolf's treatise on legal families. So, taxonomy, he says, kind of hit a peak, or perhaps in the 1950s, where there was so much classification almost to be a burden. The legal tr traditions have had mixed responses. For example, H. Patrick Glenn's legal traditions of the world. Um, but however, he notes that taxonomy is often very arbitrary, and it's um, and it has been pinned down and ridiculed. This um, Jorge Luis Borges has done this, um, and he criticized the obsession with taxonomy in his Celestial Emporium. Of benevolent knowledge. Cla and um, uh, Frankenberg notes, classifying done well is like traveling and collecting the spoils on th of the trip. So not really focusing too much on the trip itself and the objectives, but just kind of just collecting the spoils, which is not necessarily the most important part. So in terms of the futility of this, the, the futility of taxonomy is firstly there's positionality in that um, 
one focuses uh, that one must note that there is the lo the the local versus the foreign and there's been a focus specifically on the local and a dis disregard for the foreign and particularly one must note one's actual position for example is one as he knows a wasp or white anglo-saxon protestant might dictate how they create this taxonomy in the first place furthermore there's selectivity and because it's impossible to encompass the whole world and all times so for example there's been too much of a focus on common and civil law perhaps and also there's perspectivity as well which must avoid and elucidate so must one must avoid try to avoid too much uh, too specific of a perspective but more importantly one must elucidate what one's own perspective is once again is one a wasp or another uh, specific group if one at least recognizes this that's a good place to start there's also been too much of a focus perhaps on similarities and less of a focus on differences and once again whether cinderella or the queen or uh, this issue is addressed taxonomies are far from innocent from included in, in these their biases so he references one of the uh, ways of addressing this is through a thick comparison so you can leave tracks of cognition and contrast the universal construction through a Jirzian spirit, which they call a thick comparison, which is a self-critical approach of necessity. So this would involve removing the veil of innocence and addressing ethical and political implications, so not just focusing on taxonomy of uh, comparative law, as well as an intimate relationship between knowledge and power as well. So how does this actually um, how does the change in the comparative law imply or create changes in terms of knowledge and power in the academic institutions, but also in the world order, for example, as we saw in the EU itself. And recognizing social construction of facts and taxonomies um, and just recognizing these is a good place to start. So to make legal comparison accessible as an expression of cultural experiences, um, he created a chart, which I have not filled in the chart so as to avoid any copyright issues but as we see here we have the four dimensions and within the four dimensions there is the method ethics and politics so and through this you submit to various strands of mainstream comparative law and um, through this they're provincializing um, the anglo europe and orientalizing the mainstream so um, there's uh, a couple of notes. Uh, we'll, I'll go through. We'll go through examples of how things place on the four quadrants to, eluc uh, to elucidate this. But there's an infinite horizontal axis, which is the detachment and commitment, and an infinite vertical axis, which is si similarity and difference, and um, or it could also be called familiar and unfamiliar legal phenomena. The detachment must be noted is not the same as being neutral or absent of bias but with the recognition of what the commitments are and just not um, addressing them and once again I, we want to his he says one should try to aim as close to the center as possible and the extreme poles are dangerous shores so to start in the top left quadrant we have what he calls the cognitive control or the country western style which would be the similar or similarity meets detachment so this is for example in the 1920s or post world war ii where they want to so detachment they're uh, focusing on the western philosophy but similar similarity in that they're trying to imply the uh, the, the western um, hegemony across make it similar across all geographies so it's concerned with domestic law of the parent nations, and it is kind of a, um, it's a, all these do have benefits, but it would mean taking the laws of uh, existing nations and, for example, applying them in Africa. And then in the top right quadrant, they have the for Universal Dreams Inc., as he calls it, or Incorporated, where similarity meets commitment. And this is a united world where it uh, combines different, the benefits of different uh, geographies into one world order um, and it has different varieties of anti-positivism -positiv and it tr can trace 
back to Montesquieu and it has involves an exchange beyond between traditions so it sounds pretty good at the base value however the two assumptions which kind of negate it is that there is there must be a common framework for comparison to begin with so what is the best what are the best laws amongst the constituent nations so and therefore what should be applied but secondly there must the ph phenomena under scrutiny must have be essentially similar so are they even would the same law even apply in different geographies or under different peoples or under different times and therefore it might lose its political innocence and rely on in inadvertently white myth, mytho, uh, mythology so it might have a tendency anyways to go towards the detachment side and apply white mythologies anyways without um, without recognizing it and then in the bottom right they have sentimental he has sentimental amateurism amateurism which is where difference meets commitment so these are the lost amateurs from where they observe it from afar so although they have a commitment to different um, different laws across different geographies they do not uh, they, they do not have a uh, functionalism they do not apply it and they are more focused with taxonomy this also draws from Montesquieu as also representing a committed to respecting differences and what is attractive and to amateurish would gaze would be likely rejected as a candidate for inter integration in domestic legal order so although it does appreciate differences they often are too focused on the unimportant aspects of law and not the actual ones that could be a candidate for application so there's no clear political message or mission and then in the bottom left there is paralyzing skepticism where difference meets detachment so this would involve recognizing the varieties of legal skepticism through appreciation to a point of paralysis of differences so they recognize all these differences but they do not want to create the change or the functionalism and apply it and they can disturb or redirect from the hegemonic legal system amid com comparison um, they can altogether avoid the trap of ethnocentrism but they do not embrace or sometimes or choke foreign but champion radical versions of difference so often these ideas the ones like in the bottom right the ones that are attractive are the kind of fringe ideas and they're more focused on the less applicable and less common and therefore less have have less um, and therefore becomes political politically skeptical or politically apathetic that's a term that I would add and in terms of internal diverse and focus on internal diversity but skeptical of the structures to maintain a hegemony. Comparisons are never merely descriptive and they focus on divergences rather than convergences in legal systems. So those are the four quadrances. So he advocates for a thicker comparison, which would involve implying, uh, including all four quadrants and therefore kind of aiming for the middle. Um, obviously it would be beneficial to have intellectuals on all different quadrants kind of coming in the middle but they aim for the middle of grid lines through dialogue, criticism, and self-criticism. So that would be the thick component. And thick could be um, um, uh, described as productive comparisons fa where they favor context and narrative and address normative and political aspects. So they start by ending production and recursive validation of inferior others and individuals get rid of the self-delusion about objectivity neutrality and must be and this must be discontinued so just by calling it a completely objective science is also of no benefit at all because the the point of, to have any power of comparative law it does have to have some sort of function and application also they need to de-westernize some of the concepts assumptions and biases biases so that's firstly doing it directly but also just recognizing it as well and avoid the thin taxonomies and lessen the seat of innocent knowledge so too much categorization has its pitfalls and also also detracts from application and this could in bringing back to his connection and the cinderella complex per is question he poses well at least it will yield a greater adventure in comparative studies so it might not fully bring her into queen as he says but at least by applying this thick comparison 
there would be greater areas for study. So moving, that is, I'll go through the slide and then we will move to Stern, Simon Stern. So um, Gunter Frankenberg, um, we have in the top right, Go University, Universität in Frankfurt am Main, that's where he is currently a um, professor. University of Bremen, where he received a PhD. The Technical University of Munich, where he also received a PhD. The Harvard Law School logo, where he was a visiting fellow. Uh, and Tulane University Law School, where he was also a visiting professor. And Penn Law School, where he was also a visiting professor. And we have the selected re read, uh, readings, which I will reiterate here. Constitutional Perspectives, published by Elgar in 2020. Comparative Constitutional Studies Between Magic and Deceit, Elgar, published by Elgar in 2018. And Political Technology and the Erosion of the Rule of Law, published by Elgar in 2014. And the quote here again, Comparative law has a history oscillating between marginalization and megalomania. So, objective to seek something in the middle. So, to Simon Stern. Um, the, his chapter is called Literary Analysis of the Law, once again, also in the section of Locating Legal History. So a little bit about him. He received his Bachelor of Arts in English at Yale University or Yale College. And he received his PhD from, also from, uh, no, pardon me, his PhD in English from the University of California, Berkeley. He then received his Juris Doctor from Yale Law School and he passed the, and he, uh, the Washington DC bar. He was at, during, at Yale Law School editor-in-chief of the Yale Journal of Law and the Humanities. And upon completion of his legal studies, he clerked for Ronald M. Gould in the US, Supreme, uh, US Court of Appeals Ninth Circuit. He practiced as well litigation at Shia and Gardner which is now called Goodwin Proctor Law Firm in Washington, D.C. And he was a Clemenko Fellow and Lecturer at Harvard Law School before going to the University of Toronto. Currently at the University of Toronto, he is a Professor of Law and English and Director for the Center for Innovation, Law and Policy. He is also the Chair in Innovation Law at U of T as well, Faculty of Law. He is some of his contributions to writings have been the uh, this the Oxford Handbook of Legal History as is the case with Guten Frankenberg um, but as well the Oxford Handbook of Law and Humanities which he published in 2020 where he was an editor alongside Bernadette Mailer and Maximilian Del Mar who I covered in a previous video as well as the legal and literary fictions published by the Oxford University Press in 2017 which was uh, he's an editor with Bernadette Mailer, Mailer and Elizabeth Anker. So in terms of this chapter, literary analysis of the law. So literary, he opens up with literary examples are used by historians often to show doctrines, practices, or institutions and are perceived at certain, uh, perceived at a certain time. And he has this quote, which I will read. Imaginative works sometimes serve as representative illustrations of legal phenomena, sometimes as alternatives to dominant legal ideas or assumptions. So maybe I shouldn't read this whole thing. Sometimes as evidence for dissemination of legal thought or folk wisdom about the law, and sometimes as a kind of parallel formation that uses or reflects on legal methods and modes of exploration, even if the work does not expressly address legal issues. So the purpose of this chapter, however, will be focusing on the latter two. And uh, to reiterate, imaginative works work as, a, as an alternative to dominant ideas and assumptions or attempt to explain the incomprehensible. Imaginative works in the course of this video lecture and in the course of these texts is also uh, um, it, uh, synonymous with literature, but it also applies to film as well. And, um, it, and he notes that sometimes it may or may not even be explicitly addressed in the text, but it is all the, all the more relevant and still present. So evidence of dissemination of legal thought or as um, is one method or as um, parallel formation. So that, that'll be the 
um, two um, subjects of this chapter. So there's been a shift towards these approaches. There's been a and uh, for example, and in the former case, you will focus on how digital databases have allowed us to have made it possible to see how legal forms and, and doctrines have been ta um, taken up in fiction and nonfiction. And this chapter will also discuss these in the context of the Miranda warning. The second part will be more intense and will apply a more intensive approach, asking how Oscar Wilde's novel, The Picture of Dorian Gray, published in 1890, but um, again, um, updated in 1891, what uh, uses various techniques to explore the logic of obscenity laws and applies to legal regulation of language in other contexts such as libel and sedation. sedition. Pardon me. So there's really two main components of this chapter, but they'll make a lot more sense once we begin with the first, which is the on relating to the Miranda warning. So there was, um, and American judges and lawyers have long recognized that warning as part of our national culture. So there's, it's called the Miranda warning where, and it has led scholars to study the prehistory and the places in popular culture. So where did the, the reasons behind the Miranda warning start and what caused it as well. Albert Elschler said well into the 19th century magistrates and judges in England and America expected and encouraged suspects and defendants to speak during pretrial and during trial. However, after R.V. Arnold in 19, er, 1838, the King's Bench stated that magistrates should tell, in, tell their suspects in the pretrial what he thinks fit to say will be taken down and may be used against him in, in on his trial. And later in the Sir John Jervis Act in 1848, it was presented that after presenting the accused with Crown's evidence, magistrates or justice of the peace shall say to the, to the accused, you are not obliged to say anything unless you desire to do so. So these are earlier examples of the Miranda warning, which later came in. Uh, 1966. So, but whatever you, um, and to continue that, but whatever you say, say will be taken down and may be used against you. So there was a shift after uh, R.V. Arnold in 1838 from kind of getting the accused to speak as much as possible to kind of um, being honest with them that, that it's actually often best not to say too much. Eschler noted that defendants who declined to submit increased thereafter so because they changed this law that the, or they started telling the defendants that they don't have to speak there is a, a evidence of a decrease in the amount they spoke which makes sense if if one doesn't know that what they say can be used against them they'll probably speak more than if they are explicitly told that wesley oliver showed that because concerns uh, con a confession might be ruled inadmissible if a court regarded at as coerced. So the reason, as Wesley Oliver notes, is they had to say this because if there was, if they didn't say it, then there, then it could be possible that the evidence was coerced and therefore could not be used by the court. So if they say this, they say the Miranda warning, as it was later called, then there automatically it can be used. The um, a counter example is that the New York police, City Police adopted this in practice in 1945 but abandoned it in 1960 when they were again per allowed to co coerce evidence or coerce evidence became more easily admitted so through the counter example if they removed this um, this reasoning then they no longer um, they no longer applied it so this could be studied so then in terms of Simon Stern's actual literary analysis is that he says now in modern society we can study how literary um, works have affected this law through technological databases such as uh, Thomson Reuters Westlaw, Gale, Gale and, and Hein Online and LexisNexis. So or the Gale's database and collections. So there's um, in terms of 
there, within Gale, there is Wright's American Crime, which is a database of uh, many uh, literary uh, writings in the United States. And then there's also a, a, more, cre a more general crime from 1920. 19, uh, 1790 to 1920. So he does note there is a bit of a bias towards the American components because Gale has rights, which is specific rights with a W, which is specifically dedicated to American um, legal writings. But nonetheless, it still applies to the United Kingdom as well. And furthermore, there is a limitation in that through these databases, there is nothing really prior to the 1920s. Uh, or as far back as actually 1774. So there is that kind of um, limit. However, it is a pretty far back limit, so still worthy of um, study. And there probably, one might make the argument, there was significantly less writing before 19, 1774. So what he did in his study was he searched for the Miranda, the, um, the Miranda warning, which Miranda, as I'll note later, was actually from a law, Miranda v. Arizona in 1966, where it actually became a law in the United States where they had to make the statement. But nonetheless, on these resources, he made the search may, will, or can, or could, dot, 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 be used against and saw how many results showed up in texts. So 73 results showed up, of which 68 were novels, and he also included five of Conan Doyle's Sherlock Holmes stories. So. Um, there were, um, once again, noting the rights comparison did have a little bit of an American bias because they uh, rights only applied to the, the United States. However, there was also the crime, which does um, the crime database from Gale, which does include the United Kingdom. So there were two novels he notes in the late 1840s, two novels in the 19, 1850s, four to five no novels. E each decade from in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, and seven in the 1990s, so, um, or 1890s, pardon me. So obviously you can see an upward trend in the usage of this term, which is um, something worth noting. And this is all long before the Miranda warning of 1966. The 17, the first decade of the 20th, and then there were 17 in the first decade of the 20th century, and 25 in the second decade of the 20th century. So, and, at this point it said had reached the status of literary integrity but obviously it must be noted that there were more publications over this time however the trend line is um, is faster than the rate of growth in publications there were, um, there has been he also notes and this is a more uh, a important note is that there was greater fanfare in the earlier references for example, he notes in The Folgery or Best Intentions, published in 1849, there was much fanfare of, around the using of this Miranda warning, and as well as in The Mysteries of the Court of London by George W. M. Reynolds. And in this, it's used, an individual uses the Miranda warning in a hackney accent, so therefore implying that it was commonplace because um, a hackney person would not be particularly or likely to be of the upper class. If you've seen, um, I can't remember the name, My Fair Lady, she has that hackney accent and she turns, learns how to be a lady. But nonetheless, if a hackney person knew about this, um, about this Miranda warning, then it must have been pretty commonplace at this time. And also it's noted that they were used by detective police officers, so not just lawyers or magistrates. And as well in the American examples, it's been equally dramatic. For example, O'Brien's oh, The Days, The Dallies of Dalliston, or G.J.A. Coulson's The Ghost of Redbrook in 1879, and also in Fool's Errand, also of 1879, evidence that it was already commonplace at this time. And evidence that it's all a mere formality because it emphasized the because the fact that it was put in these writings was, um, and the people still spoke, m indicated that they probably knew about it beforehand or were aware of this and wanted to speak anyways, and it was kind of just a matter of speech to give them this Miranda warning. 
And also, he uses the example, if, for example, they really didn't want the individual to speak, then they probably wouldn't have given them the Miranda warning anyways. So it was kind of, they put the Miranda in there to give sort of the text a legal integrity. Furthermore, in Doyle's Sherlock Holmes, the advent, for example, The Adventure of Dancing Men in 1903, it also, they say the Miranda warning, but it fails to stop commenting. Once again, Miranda warning wasn't actually created in the name. Miranda warning didn't come until 1966, but they always, they had this warning since R.V. Arnold in 1838. So with the end, furthermore, with the exception of Mysteries of the Court of London, all of these writings were written with the, in, were included with the intent of inspiring confidence in the, the legal component of the novels, whereas the Mysteries of the Court of London was kind of questioning the Court of London anyways, but for the rest, they, they didn't put these Miranda warnings in there as a joke, but rather to make it seem like it's a real legal discussion. In the 19th century, there was also um, increasingly became detective fictions using this term so the fact that the detectives were aware of this Miranda warning too evidences that it was quite commonplace. In Alice Brown's Margaret Warner in 1902 it is used by a woman and so uh, he firstly notes that it was used by a woman to show that it was commonplace through um, perhaps wrongly but uh, also that the reader must have known about this Miranda principle otherwise they might have been a little bit they wouldn't have understood the context or the that the woman was using it or the clash anyway so the reader must have been aware of it as well furthermore there was also a, pers a noted persistence by the New York City police previously mentioned after the abandonment and this could be because or caused by uh, the inclusion of this Miranda warning in so many writings at the time. There was also, um, co but it also is even further noted that coercion also often existed in the courtroom regardless, so perhaps these novelists uh, were uh, didn't know this but were re really just uh, echoing off each other or learning from each other. And this was all before, long before the Miranda decision of 1966 and literature had made it already a part of the language of America's civic religion, which is law. And reflecting, and then, so that is the first part, so sort of how you can study the, the literary analysis of the law through using technological databases. And then the second part, he re uses the reflecting on obscenity in Dorian Gray. So, and how previous, uh, previous how fictional fictional portrayals inform legal research. So now logic and methods by which fiction operates. So like novels, judicial decisions are important not only for what they assert, but also for what they leave out. So just looking at a literary fiction by addressing, just looking for the legal terms is not enough. One must also look at what they're neglecting and maybe even find more. And that is the case that he um, reveals or um, argues in his discussion on Dorian Gray. So the picture, a little bit about the picture of Dorian Gray, if you haven't read it, it was published in Libincott's magazine in 1890 and revised in 1891 and it was, there were explicit legal events such as the, no, spoiler, but um, you should read it regardless, uh, I, there's nothing I can really spoil, but um, there, there was a murder, um, arguably under diminished um, capacity, however, and there was also blackmail involved to make an acquaintance get rid of the body. But a lot of the um, obscenities go under the scenes and are not addressed directly. Cesare Lomboso said delinquently, uh, delinquency can be read off the body, so it was criticized a lot for its obscenity, and the, uh, or so, pardon me, so there's this principle that the book relies on called Cesare Lombosos um, in that one can look at someone and tell one's delinquency. So that's something that is kind of necessary to understand the novel, but, um, but you don't need to understand Cesare Lomboso, but you just need to recognize that um, perhaps an evil person might look evil, maybe through um, uh, 
nature or nurture as well and in the book there's this painting that um, sort of so Dorian Gray stays the same throughout the whole book but the painting reflects his actions and changes with it but these are uh, details that um, uh, will make more sense shortly so in terms of the obscenity of the book itself so um, it was re recognized directly in the book for example he notes that the protagonist himself had been poisoned by a book which is a metaphor by French novel Lord um, which is a metaphor for being um, for being uh, affected and it was meant that the protagonist was poisoned by a novel by Lord Henry Walton uh, the Scots observer said the book itself was obscene only fit for criminal investigation in the department or hearing in camera so the book was heavily criticized for being overly obscene so but while defended his own work seeing each man sees his own sin in Dorian Gray what Dorian Gray's sins are no one knows he who finds them has brought them so people have um, kind of read between the lines significantly in Dorian Gray the, door, uh, the, uh, the writer Oscar Wilde defends it saying that those who are reading between the lies are lines are themselves the uh, one the sinners and he says also there is no such thing as a moral or immoral book but this book was not reprinted for 18 years after Wilde's conviction of gross indecency in England so the book was heavily heavily censored there was still a black market for it but that is a very significant time period and a very significant judgment so a little bit about the history of obscenity so research concerns effect rather than the author so they focus on the effect of the work rather than the author's intentions so Wilde's defenses of his book were not significant to have it maintained in publication and furthermore it's the basis for prosecution is based on well it's he says it's not the product of R.V. Hicklin um, as some th authors thought how and the the grounds for obscenity had existed long before however in this R.V. Hicklin test which created in 1868 which is actually after the book was published for interpreting obscene publications so this actually shows some of the forward thought of Dorian Gray the the R.V. Hicklin outlined the test for whether a piece of work or, uh, is obscene and should be removed from publication is whether it has a tendency to corrupt the minds of those whose hands the publication falls so so th and for that reason that could justify Oscar Wilde's work being removed from publication so there are a couple components so then Simon Stern breaks it apart so there are a couple components of this R.V. Hicklin test is that it focuses it doesn't uh, indirectly focus on youth for example um, those who have a tendency to um, or whose minds are susceptible to be um, affected by the obscenity does target uh, the youth furthermore uh, but it also has a component of reasonableness so it's got a dichotomy of uh, youth and reasonableness so um, furthermore it also says for those whose hands it falls which implies cheaper books which might mean that for example the wealthier individuals wouldn't just have a book fall into their hands and would therefore be more defensible against obscene books if they were to ever buy one but this book were to fall into a child's hand it could be bad but this is he calls it a Janus effect Janus is a god of two faces and of both reasonableness and vulnerability is exactly what Wilde's protagonist operates is exactly the way he operates even for example so for their Dorian Gray never ages his painting ages but he does not so it's it's showing that he is both youthful and and reasonable or and developed even his name Dorian Gray which I never noted until Simon Stern pointed it out Dorian is as anyone who's a fan of ancient Greece and Rome Dorian are the Spartans were Dorians or and uh, Hercules was Dorian they're very conservative and a, a sign of maturity 
and gray is a conservative color. It's very, you know, colorless. But nonetheless, he is a very flamboyant and also childish person. So exactly the principles on which these the test of obscene laws is exactly what uh, Dorian Gray manifests. So therefore, his writing actually manifests the, the Hicklin test before the Hicklin test was even created. And it furthermore, it ironizes it because he, for example, he mocks the speed of corruption as if, for example, as soon as he does the, the sins he does, as if he would instantly change as the picture does. It mocks it, the speed of change. And even that it could, and furthermore, would an obscene book even affect a child in this way? Perhaps he's also ironizing it as well. And therefore, the reader is perhaps, as Wilde notes, revealing his own sins and what Simon Stern calls the Wilderian paradox. So therefore, it's seen as, a, or Simon Stern notes, it is a challenge to Hicklin. And the result is akin, he says, the result is akin to watching sunlight ricochet off the hall of mirrors in Versailles. That's Simon Stern, he wrote that. What novel, the, what the rather does rather, and this is what the novel um, doesn't directly assert this, but it actually rather, it, in through the negative sense, implies the Hicklin test for obscenity. It was actually before its time of the, of the specific laws of the Hicklin test. And therefore, it is almost a deliberate trap for the literacist, in that everything Wilde does is a trap. Um, that's what Henry James says. So, therefore, there's actually a lot that can be learned from reading The Portrait of the Grey about obscene laws, even if it was in self considered obscene, in that it, it really it delineated what the obscene, the test for obscenity is, almost to the point um, precisely so therefore that is Simon Stern's chapter so that on the one hand there's this really explicit study through the Miranda warning through looking at technological databases looking at the usage of the uh, this can will or may be used against you and seeing its usage over time both not just the number but also the way it's used the enthusiasm that's used behind it but also then there's the implicit side where he has the um, the, his analysis of the portrait of Dor picture of Dorian Gray or the portrait of Dorian Gray and then used interchangeably but it's uh, originally as we can see here on the original cover was the picture of Dorian Gray but nonetheless this is implicit in that he does not explicitly say what is obscene but the character ironizes and manifests the obscene laws that were later adopted in R. V. Hicklin test in 1868 and these are as Simon Stern notes, two legitimate forms of studying legal history through literary analysis, and therefore opens a whole realm of two different fields that can be studied. So that is the chapter by Simon Stern and Stern and a little bit about him. On to the slide we have here. In the top right, we have the University of Toronto Faculty of Law, where he teaches. Below that, we have the logo of Yale Law School, where he received his Juris Doctor. Below that, we have the logo of or the of University of California, Berkeley, where he received his PhD in English. Below that, we have the logo of Yale College, where he received his undergraduate degree or Bachelor of Arts in English as well. Below that, we have the symbol of the United States Supreme, uh, United States Court of Appeals, Ninth Circuit, where he clerked. And as well, we have the picture of the original uh, publication of the picture of Dorian Gray in Lippincott's magazine, monthly magazine, and to the left we have some of the technological resources that he advocates for on the one hand of explicit literary analysis of the law. In terms of um, suggested readings, he has he was the co-editor with Bernadette Mailer and Maximilian Del Mar, who was uh, covered in the previous video, the Oxford Handbook of Law and Humanities, published in 2020 by the Oxford University Press. And also, he was a co-editor with Nathan Goodman of the Rutledge Research Companion to Law and Humanities in the 19th Century America, published in 2017 by Rutledge Research Center. 
So that is him. Uh, he is, uh, in terms of, he is, yeah. And now we will move to the comparison. So, in once again, this is all in the style of uh, Plutarch's Lives, where he goes through two lives and then compares them. It's not necessarily that these uh, people are particularly similar or particularly different. It's that they happen to go next to each other chron uh, chronologically, but they do happen to be in the same section of uh, locating legal history of the chapter, so there is at least that commonality. But we'll see there are some commonalities and differences as well. So, Frankenberg is more focused on comparative law and histories whereas Stern is you know, focused on literary analysis, so two very different fields. So um, one, however, within these two different fields, Gunter Frankenberg seems to be addressed both the issues and benefits of, of comparative law. So he was um, presented uh, one of the main issues with comparative law and its insecurity in the academic field, whereas Simon Stern is generally positive about literary analysis and only presents optimistic aspects and only two positive ways of approaching it, but doesn't, uh, did not address, at least in this chapter, any of the drawbacks of literary analysis. Therefore, Frankenberg also has a more, in his chapter, had a more general approach to objectively viewing what is comparative law and putting it on a matrix of the different ways comparative law could be done whereas Simon Stern has two specific examples from his his own research whereas his actual uh, study from from technical logical databases and a specific study of um, Oscar Wilde's The Portrait of Dorian Gray so much more specific and furthermore Simon Stern makes the use of technology and Gunt Gunter and he also has, um, seems to have more, uh, and then in terms of their actual careers, Gunter Frankenberg has had, uh, he is older, but he's done more writing on his own, whereas Simon Stern has done more contributions and more proportionally, more co-editing. And also Simon Stern has a little bit more of a career practicing as he practices litigation for a time, but also as a clerk, whereas Gunter, Gunter Frankenberg is more of a uh, strictly an academic, generally, but you know they both both might change over time. However, they both connected their chapters with fiction significantly, where Gunter, Gunter Frankenberg used the analogy of Cinderella, um, which was common throughout his whole chapter, and Simon Stern also drew from fiction through uh, the many books that were stu studied in his technological databases, but also specifically the picture of Dorian Gray. So that is the, um, the two chapters by Gunter, Gunter Frankenberg and Simon Stern and a comparison. Hope you enjoyed and thank you so much for watching.